welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi! Today's video, as you may have guessed from the title, is about Patchface, a character I hold dear. I'll share my interpretation for every jiggle of his, delve a little bit deeper into my theory about his resurrection, and make predictions about his future. So obviously, Sirin, Stannis and Mel are also very much involved. Patch is a character who, within the fandom, has the reputation of being creepy and possibly malevolent, a viewpoint I disagree with. While not everyone shares this image of him, I've come across enough analysis to say that there's a part of the fandom that considers him somewhat evil. While he is undoubtedly unsettling, moony, mentally unstable and aloof, I can see him as creepy and malleant. Pat's face is in my eyes a character that evokes mostly sadness and I sympathize with him a lot. He was a slave child from Volantis, charismatic and talented, so talented in fact that Stefan and Cassana bought his freedom. We have found the most splendid fool, he wrote Crescent, a fortnight before he was to return home from his fruitless mission. Only a boy, yet nibble as a monkey, and witty as a dozen courtiers. He juggles and riddles, and does magic, and he can seek prettily in four tomes. We have bought his freedom, and hope to bring him home with us. Robert will be delighted with him, and perhaps in time he will even teach Stannis how to laugh. Even for a fool, Pat's face was a sorry thing. Perhaps once he could evoke gales of laughter with a quip, but the sea had taken that power from him along with half his wits and all his memory. He was often obese, subject to twitches and trembles, incoherent as often as not. The girl was the only one who laughed at him now, the only one who cares if he lives or died. Patch was one of the very few slaves who could have had a better life, but that was not to be. He nearly died in a shipwreck, an event that left him traumatized and plagued by prophetic dreams. A former slave almost lost at sea and likely present in the castle during the Siege of Storm's End. He might come off as a settling due to his appearance and the disturbing prophetic jiggles at times. However, it is evident that he is just a deeply traumatized person. He clearly cares for Shirin and she obviously cares about him as Crescent points out in the class prologue. The relationship is very childish and innocent, even though Pat's face is not a kid anymore. It's touching to me, two people, one child minded due to his trauma and one literal kid, both somewhat lonely and pitied by others, have found a sort of companionship in each other. Maybe I'm a sub, but I find their characters and their relationship heartfelt in a very depressing and sad way. <laughs> That's my soft spot for both of these characters. Patch is also a very clever character from a literary standpoint, in my opinion. He assumes the role of Cassandra in our story, a seer whose prophetic visions fall on deaf ears. Much like Cassandra, cursed with the gift of prophecy and her predictions ignored, Pat's face is marked by prophetic visions after his tragic accident. His jiggles are dismissed by those around him as they perceive him as a mad and lackwit fool. Both characters possess foresight that others fail to comprehend or take seriously. Additionally, Pat is a fool, a role often dismissed or looked down upon, even though the series makes it clear that fools are many times more clever, perceptive and knowledgeable than people give them credit for. Making Pat's face a fool is a smart and interesting choice for these reasons. It adds an extra layer to the character and is likely a significant reason why, despite being a minor character, he is extensively discussed in the fandom. This fascination with minor fool characters seems to be a pattern in Song of Ice and Fire. For these reasons, I don't believe his character is secretly villain or controlled by a big bad higher power. Pat's to me is a very tragic character and fairly neutral who will likely meet a very tragic end even though it pains me to say it. The theories about him being evil seem to stem from the biased opinion Melisandre holds about him, likely influenced by his slightly off appearance and sometimes dark jiggies. In reality, aside from Melisandre's assertions, there isn't a clear instance where Pat does something to imply such malevolence. I think we need to take what burn everything in Stannis' or a high Melisandre says with a grain of salt. In my video about the Squishers, I proposed a theory about Pat and Aaron and how they did not die in the typical sense. Unlike other people who died and came back as whites, they aren't whites. What happened to them is akin to Bran's experience, I believe, but without the skin-changing ability and the guidance of the Crow. According to the Faith, the Crown foretold that the girl the Maiden brought forth would bear the King four and forty mighty sons, indicating that the Crown guides people by giving visions. And on the seventh day, the Crown had lifted her golden lamb to show him the path ahead. If Alton took up arms against Aegon the Dragon, his High Holiness saw the city would surely burn, and the High Tower and the Citadel and the Starry Sept would be cast down and destroyed. The Crown is said to have led the first raven into the world when she peered through the door of death. Much like Bran and Jorgen, the Crown had visions. When someone dies and goes through the door of death, they enter a state where they can see things. This is also observed in fever dreams and dreams of individuals who are not in a stable mental or physical condition. 
Those who have had near-death experiences, especially as children, often retain the ability to have prophetic dreams for the rest of their lives, even if they are not aware that the dreams are prophetic. Patch is not the only one, Sweet Robin, due to his frequent consumption of poppy milk, is always high as a giraffe teat, and appears to have some interesting dreams. Serene, too, had dreams of dragons waking, and she has experienced nightmares since she was very, very young. Ariane's chapter from The Winds of Winter introduces Theora Toland, who also seems to have prophetic dreams that people dismiss. In Brand's coma dream, we see the three-eyed raven telling him to fly because he has to leave, suggesting that if he didn't fly, his body would die. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know why you must leave. Why? Brand said, not understanding, falling. Because winter is coming. Brand looked at the crow on his shoulder, and the crow looked back. It had three eyes, and the third eye was full of a terrible knowledge. Brand looked down, there was nothing below him but snow and cold and death, a frozen wasteland where jagged blue-white spires of ice waited to embrace him. They flew up at him like spears, he saw the bones of a thousand of the dreamers impaled upon their points. He was desperately afraid. Now, Bran, the crow urged, choose, fly or die. Death reached for him, screaming. Bran spread his arms and flew. He is awake, he is awake, he is awake. Bran flying before death could reach him implies that his spirit returned to his body as depicted in the scene. Pat drowned. An average person can last between 1 and 3 minutes before falling unconscious and around 10 minutes before dying. It's a very bad way to go and not a quick one either. So both Aaron and Pat's face stayed in the state for long enough to start seeing stuff and wanted to linger longer so they could not die. Both these people were quite young, Pat's face was a kid and Aaron was around 16 to 20. And obviously they panicked, as Bran panicked, while he was falling and before he flew. They stayed in limbo enough to start seeing things, but they freaked out, obviously, and their spirit could not leave their body so they could die. Which is what happens when someone is dying, from what I understand from the scene above. In A Dance with Dragons, we learn that skin changers struggle to move their spirit when they are surrounded by fire. He died his first death when he was only six, as his father's axe crashed through his skull. Even that had not been so agonizing as the fire in his guts, crackling along his wings, devouring him. When he tried to fly from it, he stared from the flames and made them burn hotter. So apart from panicking and the natural instinct not to die, a person cannot move their spirit from the body when they are surrounded by something that can kill them, acting as a barrier. As seen here with fire, Varamir had fire all around him and couldn't pass. Fire, in addition to being lethal, carries attributes associated with purity, righteousness, and truth, as outlined by Melisandre. In various real-life cultures and mythologies, burning witches was a practice rooted in the belief that they couldn't escape because fire was considered holy. Varamir's inability to easily escape the fire mirrors this. Pats and Aaron, while not surrounded by fire, encountered something equally deadly, magical, and symbolically pure. Salt water. Both in the novels and in real life, salt water is considered a purifying agent, akin to fire in certain contexts. Thus, the barrier created by salt water could have had a similar effect in preventing their spirits from moving freely. Salt has long held an important place in religion and culture, and it's a fundamental part of nature. It is a necessity of life. All animals need salt. It is a mineral that has been used since ancient times in many cultures as a seasoning, a preservative, a disinfectant, a component of ceremonial offerings, and as a unit of exchange. Even the notion of holy water most likely started from salt water, since it is a good solution to use to disinfect and treat wounds. In the novels, sea water is considered holy by the Ironborn. There is also the salt and bread custom. The custom of serving bread and salt to guests is a reoccurring reference in the books. It is a welcome ritual that serves not only as a Westerosi tradition of hospitality, but also as a fundamental assurance of guest right a sacred bond of trust and honor guaranteeing that nobody in attendance, hosts and guests alike, shall be harmed. Violating the guest right is widely considered among the most atrocious moral crimes. This custom is also a real-life one in the Middle East, the Balkans, in Nordic, Slavic and Baltic countries. The bread is chosen because it is a stable food and in many cultures bread is a metaphor for basic necessities and living conditions. Salt is used because it signifies permanence, loyalty, durability, fidelity, usefulness, value, and purification. So as you can see, some of the salt attributes are very similar to the ones associated with fire, but milder and less destructive. In the novels, the wall, a very strong magical barrier, is not only covered in salt to aid with the ice, but the melting ice itself has been described as salty. 
When Bran passed through the Black Gate beneath the wall, a drop of salty water fell on him. Hot or dark, but not low enough. The door's upper lip brushed softly against the top of Bran's head, and a drop of water fell on him and ran slowly down his nose. It was strangely warm and salty as a tear. Additionally, descriptions of the wall weeping when it is sunny could also hint at the fact that the wall is made of salt water since tears are salty. The Ironborn saying bless him with salt and Theon's comment during the drowning ceremony where he thinks about how the salt burns his eyes creates another layer of similarity with fire. In some myths and songs, we also see salty barriers caused by magic, the salty marshes at the neck and the broken arm of Dorne. So maybe Iron and Patchface didn't have fire all over them to stop them from getting out of their body like Varamir, but they did have salt water all around them and they were also panicking, like Bran was, while he was falling. Unlike Bran, they didn't have guidance and they for sure remember the way they died. Since Aaron says that he visited the halls of the Drowned God and Patch was for sure dead according to the people who saved him. So it makes sense that they would go mad along with being able to have weird dreams and visions because unlike Bran who could fly so death cannot reach him, these two seem like they were touched by death. The boy was up on the third day. Maester Crescent had come down with the rest to help to put names to the dead. When they found the fool, he was naked, his skin white and wrinkled and powdered with wet sand. Crescent had thought him another corpse, but when Jomi jabbed his ankle to drag him off the burial wagon, the boy coughed water and sat up. To his dying day, Jomi had sworn that Patchface's flesh was clammy cold. Uh, this is what I think is going on with the watery resurrections, pretty much. Drowning is a relatively slow death, and the salt water around them made everything more difficult, much like fire did for Varamir. They panic enough to fly, similar to Bran, they swam, just kind of late. The first time we see Pat's face is in the A Class of Kings prologue. In this prologue we have the POV of Crescent and we witness several important events. First of all, Dragonstone received the White Raven, signaling the end of the summer. At the same time we see the Red Comet, as well as Melisandre and her powers for the first time. When Pylos returned, the girl came with him, sigh as ever, behind her suffering and hoping, in that queer side with walk of his, came her fool. On his head was a mock helm fashioned from an old tin bucket, with a rack of deer antlers strapped to the ground and hung with cowbells. Who comes to see us so early, Pylos? Crescent said. It's me and Patsy's maester. Pylos said we might see the white raven. Indeed you may. Mr. Pylos, do me a kindness and break the bird down from the rookery for the Lady Serene. It would be my pleasure. The fool turned his patched and piebald head to watch Pylos climb the steep iron steps to the rookery. Under the sea, the birds have scales for feathers. I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. Sit with me, child. This is early to come calling. Scars past dawn, you should be snug in your bed. I had bad dreams, Sirin told him, about the dragons, they were coming to eat me. The child had been plagued by nightmares, as far back as Maester Crescent could recall. We have talked to this before, he said gently. The dragons cannot come to life, they are carved out of stone, child. What about the thing in the sky? Dalla and Matris were talking by the well, and Dalla said she heard the red woman tell mother that it was dragon breath. If the dragons are breathing, doesn't that mean they are coming to life? Considering that the comet is still visible in the sky, this scene is happening relatively close in time to Danny's pyre and the eggs hatching, so we are talking about dragons for sure. Not only Pats is talking about birds with scales, but Serene also had dreams about dragons waking. Here I want to say that Serene having dreams about dragons waking and eating her might be about her upcoming death as well, but this is something I will talk about more later in this video. Here we are also see that when Pats talks about things under the sea, he hints at them being visions and dreams about actual events. This is the first jiggle we as readers see, making it very obvious that the dude says some very interesting things that makes us raise our eyebrows, because we know from a Game of Thrones that Daenerys hatched the dragons. The last line of the previous book was the night came alive with the music of dragons. It is an extremely smart way to make us focus on what Pats is saying, George could have made him sing any other of his jiggles we see in the prologue, but he chose the one that we as readers will for sure catch, but without it being too obvious. The scene continues with Serene, Crescent and Pylos talking about the White Raven and the end of summer. Will it get cold now? Serene was a summer child and had never known true cold. If the gods are good, they will grant us a warm autumn and bountiful harvest so we might prepare for the winter to come. The small folk said that a long summer meant an even longer winter, but the maester saw no reason to frighten the child with such tales. Pat's face rang his bells. It is always summer under the sea, he intoned. The merwives wear nanny moans in their hair and weave gowns of silver seaweed. I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. 
This is the first jiggle Patsy sings that we as readers do not know what it is about and if it is indeed about something. The phrase that is always summer is one we have seen used for one other thing, songs. Like under the sea, it is always summer in songs. Because it will not last, Kathleen answered sadly, because they are the nights of summer and winter is coming. Lady Kathleen, you are wrong. Brienne regarded her with eyes as blue as her armor. Winter will never come for the likes of us. Should we die in battle, they will sure sing of us, and it's always summer in the songs. In the songs all nights are gallant, all maids are beautiful, and the sun is always shining. Winter comes for all of us, Kathleen thought. For me it came when Ned died. It will come for you too, child, and sooner than you like. She did not have the heart to say it. Here Brienne is still part of Renly's guard. We as readers learn about the Rainbow Guard in the class prologue as well, and indeed the winter never came for them. Renly died and the nights of summer ended by Stannis just before winter. The line continues with one of the jiggles that almost unanimously in the fandom is agreed to be about the purple wedding and Sansa's poisoned hairnet. The Merwives wear nanny moons in their hair and weave gowns of silver seaweed. Now, nanny moons is most likely a funny Martin Fyde way to say sea animons, but it's not something we know for sure. I have no idea why and how, but some people say that it is a purple blue flower. It's not the case, there is no such flower. It is most likely about sea animons, considering Patches is always talking with analogies of sea related things. I looked at my Greek editions to see what word they used and some of my subscribers also shared translations from other languages. Water flowers and sea animals were by far the most used, with seashells, sea stars, ornaments and corals also making appearances. In some languages like Polish and in some Spanish editions they used a calc. So yes, indeed the word is most likely an Asoyaf universe name for sea animals. Sea animals have sting venoms, so this is about Sansa's poisoned hairnet. I know that there are people who are still making theories about the Purple Wedding. But personally, I think it is just a scene that was explained inside the books, and this is it. I will talk about the wedding more in another jiggle as well, but let's focus on the hairnet first. Before the wedding, Ser Dontos gave Sansa a hairnet. It was a hairnet of fine spun silver, the strands so thin and delicate, the net seemed to wait no more than a breath of air when Sansa took it in her fingers. Small gems were set wherever true strand crossed, so dark they drank the moonlight. What stones are these? Black amethyst from Asai, the rarest kind, a deep true purple by daylight. It's very lovely, Sansa said, thinking it is a sheep I need, not a net for my hair. Lovelier than you know, sweet child. It's magic, you see? It's justice you hold. It's vengeance for your father. Don't just lean closer and kiss her again. It's home. It is obvious that the poison used to kill Joffrey wasn't the hairnet, and Dontos was Littlefinger's man, and very much down to help Sansa because she was the one who saved him from Joffrey. Littlefinger at the time was with the Tyrells and Dontos told her that the net was from his friend who was out of the city and that as soon as he was back he would smuggle Sansa out. He was also very persistent that she must wear it. We also have the ghost of Highheart and her dream. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from her fangs. During the feast, Olena adjusted Sansa's net while casually joking about dead husbands and later Sansa realized that an amethyst was missing from the hairnet. Littlefinger himself confirmed that he instructed Dontos to ensure Sansa wore the hairnet and he hints at someone else being tasked with adjusting her hair and taking the poison. All Dontos had to do was let you from the castle and make certain you wore your silver hairnet. The Black Amethyst. But if Dontos who? Do you have other pieces? She shook her head. I don't... Better smile. I will wager you that at some point during the evening someone told you that your hairnet was crooked and straightened it for you. Here it's confirmed that the amethysts were actually strangler crystals, a poison we first saw in the prologue of A Glass of Kings as well. They said a victim's face turned as purple as the little crystal seeds from which his death was grown, but so too did a man choking on a morsel of food. It also gives an extra meaning to the place of origin they used for the amethysts, Asai. Beyond the walls of Asai, food is scarce, but golden gems are common. Though some will say the gold of the Shadowlands is as unhealthy in its own way as the fruits that grow there. So the amethysts were actually crystalline poison, were in Sansa's net, and as Crescent informs us in this prologue, they need to be diluted in liquid. Thus Joffrey was indeed poisoned through his wine. In the jiggle, we also see the word merwives instead of mermaids, and it could be a hint about Sansa being married to Tyrion at that point, since we also see the phrase dresses of silver seaweed. This could be about the silver in the hairnet, but I think it was about Sansa's wedding dress and her upcoming marriage. 
Cersei herself arrived with the seamstress and watched as they dressed Sansa in her new clothes. The small clothes were all silk, but the gown itself was ivory samite and cloth of silver and lined with silvery satin. This scene takes place in the chapter where Sansa informed Marjorie and Olena about Joffrey. So this was indeed the time when the Tyrells were fully convinced that Joffrey needed to be removed from the picture, thus agreeing to the poisoning. Under the sea it snows up, said the fool, and the rain is dry as bone. I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. This is the next line Pat's face sings. It could be about the general burning Meldas, since ash goes up and is dry, but I think it was about the battle beneath the wall. The words used are very similar to the one Stannis used when he was talking about his fire vision, and that vision was about the battle. With my own eyes, after the battle, when I was lost to despair, the Lady Melisandre beat me gaze into the hearth fire. The chimney was drowning strongly and bits of ash were rising from the fire. I stared at them, feeling half a fool, but she bid me look deeper and... The ashes were white, rising in the updraft, yet all at once it seemed as if they were falling. Snow, I thought. Then the sparks in the air seemed to circle, to become a ring of torches, and I was looking through the fire down on some high hill in a forest. The cinders had become men in black behind the torches, and there were shapes moving through the snow. For all the heat of the fire, I felt a cold so terrible I shivered, and when I did, the sight was gone, the fire but fire once again. But what I saw was real, I'd stake my kingdom on it. The general description here, to me, at least sounds like the battle beneath the wall, Maybe it's about a battle we haven't seen yet, but I think it was about this one. Soon they were among the tents. It was the usual wildling camp, a sprawling jumble of cook fires and peace pits, children and goats wandering freely. Sheep bleeding among the trees, horses' hides pegged up to dry. There was no plan to it, no order, no defenses. But there were men and women and animals everywhere. While at the camp, John and Mans are interrupted by the sound of a war horn alerting them of the attack. Mans order their defenses up, but a combined force of rangers from Eastwoods and Stannis' men swept down upon the camp. After the battle, we also have the execution of Rattleshirt, glamoured as Mans, and it could also be about that. Stannis again was at the wall with the Black Brothers, and he was standing above them looking down at the sacrifice. So I think this line was about these events, and it would make sense because a big reason for Stannis' involvement in these events was the fact that he himself had a fire vision. Real or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that without it, Stannis wouldn't have been persuaded so easily to take a stance about the conflict in the North. Clever bird, clever man, clever, clever fool, said Pat's face jangling. Oh, clever, clever, clever fool, he began to sing. The shadows come to dance, my lord, dance, my lord, dance, my lord, he sang, hopping from one foot to another and back again. The shadows came to stay, my lord, stay, my lord, stay, my lord. He jerked his head with his word, the bells in his antler sending up a clangor. This jiggle is the one that is repeated four times in the prologue, and Sirin tells us that he was singing it at the time even before this scene, and he couldn't stop even though she asked him to because it was creeping her out. It is obviously about Mel who is a shadowbinder. He repeatedly sings the line, the closer we get to Crescent's death. Melisandre, even though Crescent had a clever enough plan to remove her from the picture, remains alive and she becomes one of the closest advisors to Stannis, a position that Crescent had for years. The Raven was clever because it could talk. Crescent, being a maester, was a clever man, but Pat's face knew what was gonna happen prior to this event, that's why he is a clever, clever fool. He knows that Mel is here to stay. It could be somewhat of a foreshadowing about the Shadow Baby as well, but I think it's more about the general role of Mel, who is a Shadowbinder and is here to stay. Here we eat fish, the fool declared happily, waving a cod about like a scepter. Under the sea, the fish eats us. I know, I know. Oh, oh, oh. This is a line that I have seen many people think is about cannibalism, but I think it is just about Crescent and how he is gonna die. He sings it while they are eating fish, and Crescent gets closer and closer to executing his plan. But instead of succeeding, Mel just eats him, since he dies, but she stays alive. When dead under the sea, the fish eat you, so I think it's just about death. During the time, they were talking about the war and the many kings, and Pat's face started singing, under the sea no one wears hats, Pat's face said, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh meaning that none of the people involved at the time is gonna become a king in the end, with a hat symbolizing the crowns. And that was his last jiggle in this prologue. His next jiggle is in the same book in Davos 1. 
Under the sea, smoke rises in bubbles and flames, burn green and blue and black, but face sank somewhere, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. The king plunged into the fire with his teeth, cleansing, holding the leather cloak before him to keep off the flames. He went straight to the mother, grasped the sword with his glove hand, and wretched free of the burning wood with a single hot jerk. Then he was retreating the sword held high, jade green flames swirling around cherry red steel. But faces jiggle, sometimes sound kinda random, but they are not. Most of the time, they are talking about something and a word or image triggers him enough to start singing, as we saw in the prologue as well. Here he sees the fire from the sword and the burning idols of the god, and says this line that was most definitely about the Battle of the Blackwater, with green symbolizing the wildfire and the burning blue and black refers to the name of the river, which is Blackwater, and how the wildfire was burning even inside the water that was boiling, thus the bubbles. The next jiggle we get from him is in A Storm of Swords, Davos 2, when Shirin, Edric and Patris are playing Masters and Maidens. When the fool saw Davos, he jerked to sudden halt. Hopping from one foot to another he sang, Fool's blood, king's blood, blood on maiden's thigh, but change for the guests and change for the bridegroom, I, I, I. This one is obviously about the Red Wedding, where we see them take Edmure captive during the bedding ceremony, the death of Jingle Bells, who was a fool, and Robs, who was the king in the north. We see the Red Wedding two other times in visions, first in Danny's vision in Karth, and again in the dream the ghost of Highheart had. Under the sea, the old fish sit the young fish, the fool muttered at Davos. He bobbed his head and his bells clanked and sinned and sang, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. This one takes place in Davos 5, A Storm of Swords, where we see them talking about sacrificing Edric Storm and Davos saying to Mel, if the leeches killed Balon and Rob, then why only two died and not three? After that, Davos seeks out Maester Pylos, who has been teaching him how to read, and in the meantime, Pat's face and Shireen are passing by and we hear Pat sing this jiggle. This jiggle is again about the purple wedding and Olena taking the poison from Sansa's net so they can kill Joffrey, I think. It is very much on theme with what is going on in the scene and the conversation, and is very close to the events of the Purple Wedding. I really don't know why so many people have an issue with this event, to be honest. It makes sense and is on par with the characters' personalities involved, so I really don't get why there are so many theories about something we know how it happened. Joffrey was on his way to becoming a second Mad King, Littlefinger even told Ned he was planning to control the realm through the boys, but points out that Joffrey is too hard to control and thus he can always remove him and have Tommen in his place. Renly has the same plan, and the entire small council minus Pycelle was planning his removal. The poison was for Joffrey, for sure, and was in crystalline form, so it was 100% put in his wine. We even have a tutorial from Crescent on how the Strangler works in the A Class of Kings prologue. I have seen people talk about the pie. But the pie was served to everyone in pieces from a communal dish, and the same goes for the gravy, so how the hell did not a single other person die, since the poison must have been in the crust or generally in the whole pie and dissolved during the making, and the food was served from the king's seat down. Littlefinger knew that the Tyrells had ambitions, he knew that Orlena would not let Marjorie marry Joffrey if she knew his real character, so he made sure that they would hear about it. Olena and Marjorie themselves asked Sansa about Joffrey before the wedding, and Olena, as I said before, was joking about dead husbands at the wedding. Olena was the one who took the strangler from Sansa's hairnet, and it was Marjorie who put it in the wine so she could make sure Joffrey would die, and she or someone else wouldn't accidentally get poisoned in the process. So yeah, the old fish it's the young, I think is about Joff's death and Olena's involvement. If it's not about it, I would bet that it is about Sirin's burning. In the chapter we also have the matter of Edric Storm, Maybe Stannis didn't sacrifice Edric, but he eventually will do it to Shireen. Pat make his comeback in A Dance with Dragons, John 9. In the dark the dead are dancing, Pat's face shuffled his feet in a grotesque dance step. I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. I think this is something we have not yet seen, and it's about Hardhome, and how this is gonna be a massacre with the others. Mel also had a fire vision that is about it as well, I think. Snowflakes swirl from a dark sky and ashes roses to meet them. The grey and the white whirling around each other as flaming arrows arch above a wooden wall, and dead things stumble silent through the cold beneath a great grey cliff, where fires burned inside a hundred caves. Then the winds rose and the white mist came sweeping in, impossibly cold, and one by one the fires went out, afterward only the skulls remained. There are people staying there currently with Mother Mole, so obviously in their camps and inside the caves, 
there are fires and people. John assigned Tormund to go and rescue them. So the arrows of fire are also make sense. And then the cold comes, the dead come, and one by one the fires die out. So yeah, I think both visions are about hard home. In the next John chapter, we see them getting ready to go to the Feast of Alice and Sigorn, where we see Pat sing under the sea the merman feast on starfish soup and all the serving men are crabs. Pat's face proclaimed as they went, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. This line, I think, has to do with sigils. Wyman's plotting with Davos and the feast with a phrase. The merman feast on starfish soup is about the plotting against the Bolton, whose sigil resembles a starfish, and the fact that all this plan started during the feast he hosted for the phrase. The all the serving men are crabs is again about the sigil of House Borel, and how both the phrase and Davos passed from Sisterton to Rich White Harbor, with Davos being literally delivered to Wyman's court by Godric, when he could have easily given him to Cersei or kill him himself. In John 11, when Selyse was talking with John and Val, Pats also was there and sang The Crow, the Crow, Pats face cried when he saw John. Under the sea the crows are white as snow, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. This is, I think, about the epilogue and the white raven in King's Landing. The white ravens of the citadel did not carry messages as their dark cousins did. When they went forth from Old Town, it was for one purpose only to herald that change of seasons. The White Raven arriving in King's Landing is the official arrival of the winter, is very important, and this is exactly the reason it happened in the epilogue, before the winds of winter, and in the scene it was also accompanied by death for extra symbolism. Passface used the word crow because he saw John, who is called crow, but the picture is the same, a normally black bird will be white. The next vision comes in John 13. Lord Snow, who will lead this raging? Are you offering yourself, sir? Do I look so foolish? Pat's face jumped up. I will eat it. His bells rang merrily. We will march into the sea and out again. Under the waves we will ride seahorses and mermaids will blow our sea shells to announce our coming. Oh, oh, oh. I have talked about this jiggle again in my video about Justin Massey. This rhyme of Pat's face takes place when people were talking about rescuing the wildlings and the Night's Watchmen trapped in Hardhome. In general, what was going on there was quite similar to what Stannis was going through during the march to Winterfell. Very harsh winter, and along with other difficulties, people resorted to cannibalism in both situations. As I said, Pat's face's rhymes tend to be kind out of nowhere, but not at random. Here, for example, they are talking about an important mission, but whoever chose to lead it is gonna be a fool. In Theon 1 from Winds, we learn that Stannis orders Sir Justin to accompany the banker Tyhon Astoris back to Bravos and Jane pull back to the wall. Once in Bravos, he will use the gold from the Iron Bank of Bravos to hire at least 20,000 cell swords, plus the ships needed to bring them back across the narrow sea. Stannis tasks Justin to return with the cell swords, even if he falls in battle, and to fight the war in the name of Serene. I talked extensively in that video about how Justin falls under the archetype of the drowned fool along with people like Pats, Davos, Dontos, Theon, and Aeron. Throughout the story we have fools, metaphorical and actual ones, who have almost drowned but have somehow miraculously survived. After this event, we see a noticeable change in their character, with them being aware of things and information the rest of the characters around them are not. Justin fits this archetype and I think is heading down this path, not in a Pats face or a Theon situation, but a Davos one. Justin is a person that people described as pleasant in manner, ready to smile, and often telling jokes with a glib tongue, and we have two nicknames for him, Prancing Fool and Smiler. People think of him as a fool and soft, they do not take him into consideration now that his house seat was taken from him, and on top of that he is in the perfect position to learn about many things like John's death, grief, or the fact that Wyman is not with the Boltons, which Stannis is not aware of. So we have a person people call a fool, that we learn many important things ready to make a trip. He digs the boxes like the rest of the characters I mentioned, and we know for a fact that the weather isn't ideal and that many fleets have been in wrecks. The right conditions are there. Stannis assigns an important mission to a person that people call a fool. Justin, are you offering yourself, sir? Do I look so foolish? Pat's face jumped up. I will lead it. Pat's face will not lead it, but Pat's face is a fool. So a fool will lead it, and Justin fits this archetype. We will march into the sea and out again. This line to me sounds like we will drown, but we will come out again. So a shipwreck looks like the most logical scenario in my opinion. They will be in a wreck, but Justin, like Davos, Pats, and Aaron, 
will survive this. Under the waves, we will ride seahorses. Here they are talking about sigils again, I think. Very often we see people in dreams, visions and prophecies being represented by their house sigil or animal in some cases. And I think it is the same here. The seahorse is the sigil of House Velaryon and we do have a very intriguing person with a crew and warships under his command in the story, the bastard of Driftmark, Auren Waters. The house as a whole is with Stannis. We saw Velaryon sigils during the battle beneath the wall. We know that when Cersei was arrested, Auren took the new ships of the royal fleet and left. We do not know exactly where he is, but in the Arian chapter from the Winds of Winter, Valena told of a new pirate king on Torturer's Deep at the Stepstones with the name the Lord of the Waters, who commands three decked warships. From the moment this chapter was published, many readers have theorized this is to be Auren, with the title Lord of the Waters being a play on Waters, his bastard surname, and the traditional title of the head of House Velaryon, Lord of the Tides. If he is the person at the Stepstones, why stay there and not join Grief from the start? The Golden Company has men on the Isles, why did he declare himself a pirate if he is to join Grief? And about Danny, he isn't aware that Danny wants to come to Westeros, he just knows that she has dragons and that she exists. If the Lord of the Waters is indeed Auren, it seems like he is waiting for the right moment to join a side, as well as to collect more information. Auren is already familiar with Stannis and even supported him. Of all the candidates for the throne that Auren is aware of, Stannis is the one who doesn't care about birth. He made Davos his hand because Davos is competent. If there is a place where Auren would be recognized and appreciated for his skills, it would be with Stannis. Stannis pardoned the lords who kneeled to Renly, so if Auren arrives with help to join his house and Stannis, I could see him being pardoned if Stannis is still alive. Justin 100% will have to go to the disputed lands and the Stepstones, since the Golden Company is not available and ships and cell sails are found there. Justin will have gold, knows Auren, and Auren's idea to build the ships led to Cersei's postponement of her death and the Iron Bank having an agreement with Stannis. And he currently has these ships. Mermaids will blow our sisal to announce our coming. The mermaids here refer to the granddaughters of Wyman Manderly, Wyla and Winifred, I think. It is obvious they are aware at least partially of Wyman's plan, and right now they are the ones at White Harbor since Wyman is at Winterfell. If either Davos or Justin arrives at White Harbor with recon and reinforcements, and Auren is with them, they would be the ones to play the middleman. So I think this little jiggle of Pat's face is about Justin and Auren, and even possibly Davos if he has returned to White Harbor as well with recon, arriving north and Wyla and Winifred communicating with Wyman at Winterfell. In the same chapter, when Selyse was talking about Garrick's daughters and the weddings between Freefolk and the houses from south of the wall, Pat says, under the sea men marry fishes. They do, they do, they do. After they continue talking about Val's wedding and how she must wed as well with someone for alliances, I think the jiggle is about this. Men marry fishes is about unusual matches that at first glance do not fit together. It is simply southern houses marrying wildlings and the most important one that could lead to a strong alliance is Val's wedding, so Val will marry someone south of the wall. These are all his jiggles, so let's move to the depressing part of the video. <laughs> that creature is dangerous. Many a times I have glimpsed him in my flames. Sometimes there are skulls about him and his lips are red with blood. I think that this line is one of the lines that points out how biased Mel can be and how much of a fanatic she is as well. She says this line after he hears Pat singing one of his prophetic jiggies. And it seems that she believes him upon of, or something of the great other. She's aware that Pat doesn't just say random bullshit. And he has a connection to something. Since it's not her god, it must be the great other. She has seen other people surrounded by skulls, like John, and the vision I mentioned above that was most likely about Hardhome. And she comes to the conclusion that these people are in danger, not that they themselves are dangerous. But somehow these visions are not about Paz's death, but about something that he will do. Under the sea, the mermen feast a starfish soup, and all the serving men are crabs. Pat's face proclaimed as they went, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. Melisandre's face darkened. That creature is dangerous. Many a times I have glimpsed him in my flames. Sometimes there are skulls about him and his lips are red with blood. I wonder you haven't had the poor man burned. All it would take was a word in the queen's ear, and Pat's face would feed her fires. The I wonder you haven't had the poor man burned is written in a tilted font, foreshadowing even more that Pat's face is gonna die by fire most likely as a sacrifice to feed the fires. 
She sees skulls because, like every other person with skulls around them in her visions, it's about his upcoming death. I know that some people do not believe that Stannis will burn Sirin, and if this happens, it wouldn't be him, but Mel and Selyse. But I disagree very, very much. Except for the fact that George Martin has confirmed it as a plot point, I personally think it makes a lot of sense. This event will happen, and Stannis will be the one who will agree, and it will be different and very much on par with his character. People forget, or choose to forget, because they are rooting for him, that they believe wholeheartedly that Stannis is or a high, thus he must sacrifice something he loves to be able to save the world. Stannis is not just a hero in the story, Stannis is the most tragic hero of the story. A tragic character with the official definition from the ancient Greek tragedies. Stannis is an amazing character because he's a complex one, not because he's the goat. And take that from a person who likes him a lot, as you have seen, tragic heroes typically have heroic traits that earn them the sympathy of the audience, but also have flaws or make mistakes that ultimately lead to their own downfall. Stannis embodies this archetype to a T. Both capable and powerful, meaning heroic, feeling obligated to uphold the rules of honor and morality. These are the traits that make the hero attractive and compelling, and gain the audience's sympathy. But he's also flawed. While being heroic, the character must also have a tragic flaw, and be subject to human errors, and the flaw must lead to the character's downfall. These flaws make the character relatable, someone with whom the audience can identify. They make the tragedy more powerful because it means that the source of the tragedy is internal to the character, not merely some outside force. His flaws are not just characteristics they have in addition to their heroic qualities, they emerge from their heroic qualities, a righteous quest for justice or truth that leads to the terrible conclusion. Without his flaws, without his downfall, Stannis is not as amazing of a character. It is sad, it is tragic, but it is also effective. Stannis ground his teeth again. I never asked for this crown. Gold is cold and heavy on the head, but so long as I am the king I have a duty. If I must sacrifice one child to the flames to save a million from the dark, sacrifice is never easy, Davos, or is it no true sacrifice? Tell him, my lady, as a high-tempered lightbringer with the heart's blood of his own beloved wife. If a man with a thousand cows gives one to God, there is nothing. But a man who offers the only cow he owns? This is the most uncharacter and tragic line Stannis has ever said in the whole series. It is not just there for the sake of it, it is a very tragic foreshadowing. His duty is his downfall. Stannis, according to Mel, must make a big sacrifice, and the sacrifice must be something for Stannis, not for someone else. It must be something that he holds dear. Daenerys lost her child, she killed Drogo and Miri, amidst salt and smoke. She sacrificed a lot, sacrificed the blood of a person touched by magic, holy blood. Her kid and his father, and woke dragons from stone. Euron is planning to sacrifice his unborn child, its mother, and his brother, a holy man with holy blood, that was drowned and reborn from the sea. These are the last days when the world shall be broken and remade. A new god shall be born from the graves and charnel pits. Then Euron lifted a great horn to his lips and blew, and dragons and krakens and sphinxes came at his command and bowed before him. Kneel, brother, the crow's eye commanded. I am your king. I am your god. No, I will not kill you tonight, a holy man with holy blood. I may have need of that blood later, for now you are condemned to live. Naked as the mouthless maiden, her smooth belly just began to swell with the child she was carrying. Her cheeks red with tears, she did not struggle as the boys tightened her bones. Her hair hung down in front of her face, but they don't knew her all the same. Falia flowers, he called, have courage, girl. All this will be over soon and we will feast together in the drowned god watery halls. The girl raised up her head, but made no answer. She had no tongue to answer with, the dampier knew. He licked his lip and tasted salt. What makes Stannis different from all these Azura High characters? Stannis will sacrifice his daughter, who is partly stone from the grayscale. He will sacrifice Patch with her, who is touched by the salt water, who is touched by magic, a holy fool with holy blood, and I even think he will sacrifice Elise. The dragon has three heads, they need three people. After all, Danny and Euron had their child other parent in the mix. And not just that, but burning his stony daughter to wake dragons from stone could be an interpretation of the prophecy. Sirin is also scaly, like Gregor was since he was a dragon baby. Mel in her visions, where she asked to show us or a high, she sees most likely Euron. Show me your king, your instrument. Visions dance before her, gold and scarlet, flickering, forming and melting and dissolving into one another, shape, strange and terrifying and seductive. She saw the eyeless faces again, staring out at her from socket weeping blood. Then the towers by the sea, rumbling as the dark tide came sweeping over them, rising from the depths. If the tower by the sea is indeed Euron in Old Town, 
who says that she will not think of these events as instructions of what she must do. She must convince Stannis to bear his daughter and her mother, to bear the drowned fool that came back with visions that most likely, like Falia, will have a cut tongue, and this is why he sees pads with blood dripping from his mouth and skulls. Because he will die, and like Euron does, they will cut off their tongues before the sacrifice. And that would also explain the very, very cute scene, but also very sad as well, where Pat says, away, away, the fool sang. Come with me beneath the sea, away, away, away. He took the little princess by one hand and drew her from the room, skipping. Because they are gonna die together. Now that was depressing. But I also think this will very much be the case. That's why I will stop here. If you have ideas, comment them down below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks a lot for watching and until the next video, bye!